Good evening, good morning, wherever you are. I welcome you to Radio Wolf, our global webcast for consciousness and culture. My name is Thomas Steininger. I'm very happy and pleased to have Dr. Machoy Balakut with me in our show. Dr. Balakut, welcome to Radio Wolf. Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I had already the honor to interview you for our German magazine uh, that we had about the limits and the power of science. You are a scientist yourself. You served as the chair of the Department of Physiology and as a member of Neuroscience Institute in the University of Oregon. And you also taught complementary and alternative medicine and meditation. And you are president of the Academy of the Advancement of Post-Material Science and the research director of the International Association of near-death studies. So you have an interesting combination. You are a new scientist. You know, obviously, uh, you have a, a very specific relationship to neuroscience. Neuroscience being kind of the, the bedrock of materialist science as it is right now, uh, the avant-garde of materialist science. But it seems that you also have a particular interest in consciousness that is different. So I would like uh, to start uh, the conversation by asking you, how did this develop your expertise in neuroscience and your interest in consciousness from the perspective of consciousness itself, if I may say so? All right, so I guess I'll start out with the fact that I was, as I would often call it, raised in a materialist science framework, because that's exactly what happens in any neuroscience graduate school. So you're taught that the world is basically made out of material particles and that our brain is in fact what creates our consciousness and we accept this as our absolute truth in um, graduate school as neuroscientists. And I, in fact, have been, as you said, at the University of Oregon for many years. I just retired recently and pretty much all of my colleagues were exactly of the same persuasion. But then what happened to me is that shortly after becoming a professor of neuroscience, I was invited to a meditation retreat by my sister who had been meditating for a few years and she gave it to me actually as a birthday present. And, you know, I was skeptical about meditation and spirituality because of my materialist background in neuroscience, but there was a part of me that was curious. And so I decided to attend. And I still remember on the first morning of that meditation retreat, I was in this darkened room and the Indian meditation master was coming around to initiate every person in the room. And I recall on the one hand being skeptical, but saying, look, I'm here for the weekend. I'm just gonna put my skepticism aside and see what happens. And in my first meditation, I had an experience that was totally unexpected by me in terms of being a neuroscientist. I had this feeling of energy going from the very center of my heart and radiating outward in this incredible feeling of joy and love and interconnectedness with other beings on this world. And I remember during that meditation as that began to happen, there was this part of me that said from someplace deep inside of me, I'm home, I'm home. My heart is my home. And I remember thinking, wow, you know, this is a different part of reality of experience that I've never really had before. And Interestingly, I went back to my university position at the end of that retreat, and the very next morning I got up to meditate. And in fact, I've been meditating ever since because of the satisfaction it gives to me in some deep, deep way that allows me to feel more interconnected with other people, with planet, and with my own self, with my own heart. So that was the start of this transition, I might say, in terms of saying, okay, maybe those experiences I had in meditation need to make me curious about whether science might need a broader framework than I originally thought it needed to really put that sort of thing into the framework as well and to help me see the universe in a slightly more expanded way, a more inclusive way. The way I hear you, um, you had this scientific education mm -hmm. and you had this experience in meditation. Other people also had this uh, experience of meditation and uh, came to maybe different conclusions than you because uh, to have a deep, deep, powerful experience of meditation um, is one thing, but the scientific mindset 
that has a certain understanding what reality is about, how we access reality also relates to this kind of deep experience in a certain way. Um, why did you think that you had to expand your understanding of science because of the depth of your meditation experience? Uh, that's a good question. I first want to say that when one has a deep experience like that, and I would say it also relates to things like having a near-death experience that we may talk about later, some people stay in that scientific mindset and they simply say, well, that was an interesting experience, but it doesn't really relate to reality. It was my imagination or um, maybe a hallucination or something like that. And they enjoy it, but they put it aside as outside of their scientific framework of reality. And other people like myself have something happen that is so deep that it changes the way we see the world. And what I laugh about sometimes when I talk to other people who meditate, who might um, have a feeling of the same set of resonance is that suddenly my heart was open and it was talking to me and it was saying, this is what I want in life. I want this experience of joy and I want this experience of interconnection. And I would laugh to people to say that it was like my heart was now in a certain sense pulling me forward in a new direction. And my mind was running after it to catch up, to try to understand and to put this into a context that was a bigger context. So for me, it was a big enough shift at a deep enough um, intuitive experiential level that I had to explore it. Maybe that's the difference. I was now curious to try to understand how this might be able to actually broaden my understanding of reality. Whereas I think some of my friends who have had experiences in meditation simply say, well, that was interesting, but it didn't really make them curious about expanding their understanding of reality. And there's also a response uh, that I'm aware of where people say, wow, this is a powerful part, uh, maybe, maybe in nature, maybe in meditation, uh, uh, maybe with other people. And um, poetry is the right way to relate to this. Poetry, mythology, uh, they're powerful. That's, that's all uh, a very important uh, part of what our culture is about. And, and I really read poetry, but it's not science. Science, uh, is something that has to be objective, that uh, has to fulfill certain criteria of what reality is. Because in the end, uh, we are already touching on it. We are asking the question, what is reality? What is the world? And we have different answers. Let's say answers that came from poetry. And then people say, if a poet says this, that's powerful and you can relate to this. But this is not the scientific way how to look at it. But it seems you don't make this distinction the same way. And my question is, why not? That's a very good point. And I think it's because one of the things we've discovered is that when you really try to look at understanding of the world, there are two perspectives that now many scientists are understanding are both valid. The first is what we would call that third person objective scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. And that is where you basically are trying to look at phenomena in the world from outside of your own experience of that phenomenon as objectively as you can. And so that you're looking at the other and trying to explain it. But what we've discovered is that another very important way of looking at reality is what we would call the first person subjective or phenomenal perspective of experience. And this is absolutely critical because in fact, what quantum physics has told us um, through many um, Nobel Prize winning quantum physicist is that you cannot separate consciousness really from matter or the observer from what is being observed. And because every time we observe something, we affect it and we are interpreting it through our own lens of our own um, awareness, we have to make sure that we include the observer in our experiments and at least understand how the observer and the observed affect each other. And I think what we've discovered in science, especially in medical science, is that when you only try to look at health objectively and you don't take into account, for example, the person's own phenomenal experience of their health, you lose a lot of understanding about what is really happening with the person. And I'm just going to give you a simple example that I find fascinating. And that is that for a long time, medical healthcare professionals did not want to take into account a person's own subjective experience, for example, of pain when they were giving them painkillers. And so they would try to use some sort of a, a um, 
way of measuring the amount of pain they had that was objective. And finally, a number of years ago in the United States, a new amount of legislation was actually created to say you have to take into account the person's um, subjective experience of pain on a scale of one to 10 and give them a pain reliever that is relating to their subjective experience because it wasn't working by trying to just do it objectively. And I have another interesting example from a very good friend who is in the medical field whose husband ended up finding out that he had uh, symptoms that seemed like prostate cancer, and he was concerned about that. So he went to his doctor, and the doctor did a PSA test, the standard test, and he said, no, your PSA levels are very, very low. You don't have prostate cancer. You're fine. And he said, no, 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 my symptoms are such that I know that there's something wrong in terms of like my urination ability and things like that. And so he had to fight with the doctor to actually get a biopsy. And of course, what they found was that he had prostate cancer and that they did then an operation early and he hasn't had it returned. But it was that example where if they had just listened to the objective data, they wouldn't have found the cancer. The person's experience was critical to that. And mm -hmm. I have heard more and more MDs tell me that they are now trying to shift to a combination of objective and subjective data to really get the truth of medical um, diagnosis, which is absolutely a critical part of science. So I think that there's one example of how we have to really combine those two understandings to actually see the world in a complete, well-rounded way. Because um, my interest is really it, in the relationship that we have uh, to science and the limitation of science and also the, the, the power and the necessity of science. Uh, I think what you are touching on right now is also that it seems there are certain areas where the achievement of uh, modern science also uh, show their limits because there's no doubt that modern science is a very powerful unbelievable revolutionary thing and uh, that it is important uh, to acknowledge this and not go into some kind of uh, uh, bashing of science. Yes. Yes. But medicine and maybe ecology on the other side are, ter are territories, and you described it right now, where it's obvious that uh, science with its own objective materialist methodology is touching limits. Yes. Uh, it's not it, it's not doing what science uh, is supposed to uh, achieving results mm -hmm. and uh, it shows something that maybe shows that science is uh, uh, a powerful perspective that allows us to see things that we were not able to see before but on its own it's just one possible perspective it just shows one possible way of seeing reality and at different areas where it fails looking. And it seems that that's what you're touching on. And my question is, is this also something that you see in your own research field as a neuroscience where you see the materialist perspective is powerful, but there are limits that are visible and that we have to address and that we have to go beyond. Right. I think that's absolutely critical. And I would say, yes, that's the case. And of course, as a neuroscientist in rehabilitation neuroscience for many years, and still I have a textbook in its fifth edition related to rehabilitation neuroscience, I understand the vast information that we have gathered that can really help patients um, in terms of their healing, in terms of understanding their illnesses, things of that sort. Saying that, what we've also discovered is that science is limited because when we're looking at things like consciousness, which is again my own area of research expertise, all science can do in studying the brain is tell us about the neural correlates of consciousness. All it can do is say, okay, we can tell you what part of the brain is active when you are experiencing a particular mental state, whether it's sleeping, um, dreaming, wakefulness, or in a coma, we can tell you the neural correlates of those states. But what we can't really do is say actually that the brain is causative of that particular state. And I think that's the thing that we as neuroscientists often forget and that I often forgot when I was a young neuroscientist. All I'm looking at is correlation and it doesn't tell me whether consciousness is producing or modifying brain activity or whether the brain is actually producing or modifying my conscious state. And in fact, now that I've begun to do more research on areas like near-death experience, I see that in fact, 
consciousness works both ways. Um, consciousness actually modifies my mental state and my brain activity and vice versa, my brain activity can change my mental state. And so I think that until we do the correct experiments and take them seriously, like looking at patients that have had a near-death experience with cardiac arrest, the heart has stopped, the brain activity is now flatlined, no EEGs anywhere in the cortex that are detectable, and look at what the person's experience is when their EEG is flatlined, their heart has stopped for often a number of minutes. And by the way, it takes something like 20 to 40 seconds for all brain activity to stop after cardiac arrest. If we then do these experiments, and of course they have been done by people, for example, Pim Van Lomo in the Netherlands, one MD that did it, Bruce Grayson in the United States and others. What we find is that these people without any brain activity are actually observing the resuscitation team from above going ahead and trying to get their heart to actually function again. And they are telling specific details about everything that happens in the resuscitation room. And I don't know how my materialist perspective could actually account for that. I mean, first of all, the person's eyes are taped shut and yet they're viewing everything from above their body, from outside the body and very, very accurately. And the doctors typically throw out their hands when they have a patient tell them those things because they say, we don't know how to explain that. First, um, uh, I, I assume that you say that uh, the evidence of this phenomena is, is strong and, and undispu undisputable. I would say that, yes. And I would say that any materialist who's willing to look carefully at those data that have been published in a number of articles in peer reviewed journals would have to say the same thing or else they would have to say that these people are actually just um, confabulating the evidence because it's so strong and so clear when they show these particular instances of patients mm -hmm. having those experiences. And so you're saying there, uh, Thierry Stan really has a problem because uh, until now, um, we can say, okay, uh, there, there is the subjective side, there is the phenomenological eye perspective, there's consciousness, and um, this shows up in material science, not necessarily has a problem with that. And, and we all even have a science, and it's called psychology, that is dealing with this uh, uh, phenomenon. And it, this is just how you, ever you want to interpret it, usually as an epi epiphenomenon of new neurological uh, mechanisms. And uh, we don't really know where the transition is, this what is called the heart problem of consciousness. And uh, people say, we don't know, somehow it happens. But you say we have, there's an additional thing that this phenomenological side of reality uh, happens. Uh, that's why a near-death experience seems to be a very interesting uh, field of research where what usually is the, uh, cause or understood to be the cause of this uh, subjective experience, our brain functions where these brain functions uh, are not working anymore. Uh, there's, there's nothing uh, that really can support a subjective experience. And you're saying that there are so many accounts that there is empiric research uh, that uh, there is something and uh, if that's the case, uh, what is a rational response or a rational explanation for this kind of reality? And maybe this questions the particular uh, only materialistic perspective what the relationship between uh, the outer world and the inner world is about. Yes, absolutely. And I think that one of the things that I want to emphasize is that the studies that have been done, like this one by um, Pim Van Lommel and his colleagues that was published in the Lancet Journal, which is again ranked number two in medical journals, basically was a prospective study, which is the gold standard of medical studies where you bring everyone in to this a network of hospitals um, in the Netherlands from a particular day and time. And then you examine everyone that has cardiac arrest and survives over like about a three or a four year period to get a sufficient number of patients. And you interview all those people that survive and you know then what was their EEG during um, the cardiac arrest, you know, a lot about their own condition. And then you look at the data very, very carefully and by interviewing them, you find out how many people actually were able to be conscious outside of their body watching what happened. And even if you had only one person 
how could you explain that? I mean, I the point is that they have built more than one person. And I think one of the things that I would like to see when people say, well, that's just anecdotal, or you only had a few people, I would say the way to solve that, if scientists are really curious about it, is to have government funding to do these sorts of studies in many, many hospitals. They're not that difficult to do to basically look at cardiac arrest patients and interview them afterwards. And I think we would probably find that the prevalence is quite, quite large if we gave the particular um, study um, paradigm a chance and really looked at it more carefully right now from a perspective across um, Europe, United States, the world. So uh, I hear also that you're saying right now the response from material science is that the evidence that there is is only anecdotal. There is not broad enough evidence to be brought uh, to support this kind of view. That's yes, that's what they're saying, and I I disagree because I when you look at the number of studies that have been done. Um, what is it to me? An anecdote is one study that's usually or one case that is often retrospective, where the person simply says, "Well, back three years ago, I had a near-death experience, and this is what I experienced." And you don't have any collaborative evidence to actually back that up. But in this case, these are clearly evidential studies done in a very careful setting in a network of hospitals with MDs that are highly trained. And also, it seems to be obvious. Uh, even if that would be the case, that is anecdotal, uh, this is an area of research that would be so uh, uh, fundamental to the way we as a culture, we as a civilization, experience and interpret us as a human species, that there would be a lot of arguments to basically get clear on this question. Absolutely. I mean, that's, I think, what those scientists that I would call the post-materialist scientists feel it. We're simply saying, let's get curious as an academic academy of science and look at this very, very carefully because if it ends up being actually proven with a widespread research, it would really change our whole way of being as humans to begin to understand, first of all, the continuity of consciousness and to also understand the continuity across generation and generation and generation that we really do need to be very, very concerned about protecting not only each other, but the earth for um, consciousness to continue in a very healthy and protected way throughout the years to come. So what are the arguments that you're meeting? I'm sure you're pushing for wider research and I'm, I'm sure it, it sounds like uh, that you're meeting resistance there. Uh, Absolutely, yeah. What, what's it, the argument? What, 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 Besides that, uh, the, the, the argument that we don't have money, uh, uh, what is the argument that this is not interesting enough to put research into that more? You know, I think what's intriguing when you actually talk to a number of, of neuroscientists and psychologists is that, um, in fact, people who were in laboratories of well-known neuroscientists and they were actually talking to their professors about this research, the professor would simply say, I'm not interested in it. That would be their comment. I'm not interested. This doesn't seem interesting to me. And I think it's because they're coming from the materialist perspective that they grew up in. And the materialist perspective said, this is paranormal. It's not normal. This is not something that's of interest to us in our way of looking at the world normally. And we're saying it's not paranormal. This is very normal. We just have to expand our normalcy understanding to include near-death experience as a very normal phenomenon. And in fact, when you actually ask people how many people have had near-death experiences, it's amazing how many have. And I think that's the beauty of, again, this group, the International Association for Near-Death Studies that I'm the researcher for, they are collecting these experiences from people. And these are amazing stories of, first of all, not only the near-death experience, watching the resuscitation team, for example, in the operating room from above and outside their body, but then how it transformed their life. And maybe, mm -hmm. Thomas, that's the key issue. It's like the point is that once you've had an experience like this, near-death experience or a deep experience in meditation, you shift your feeling from one of isolation from other people, thinking that we're all just machines and we're totally separate. And when consciousness dies um, through our brain stopping functioning, we're gone to a whole new understanding that we are interconnected with all other human beings mm -hmm. and beings on this planet. And now you treat the world as sacred, as this wonderful place and other beings as sacred and you want to take care of them. And suddenly, you feel a loving connection that changes your behavior entirely in the world. 
And just objectively, you seem to have a point there, because even if you see this as a pair, uh, this is something paranormal, uh, uh, it's hard to make an argument that this is not interesting. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's paranormal. It maybe questions a lot of things that we believe in, but uh, why is this an argument that this is not interesting? Uh, and, and not just personally interesting, but interesting for how we as a culture and also as, as a medicine uh, community uh, re relates to life, death, now human experience. Uh, I think the argument that this is maybe very interesting is very obvious. Right. Well, if something else I want to mention that's difficult about shifting our way we look at the world as scientists, for example, is that scientists are afraid to share an information about a meditation experience or a near-death experience or some other unusual experience with other scientists because they're afraid they will be considered non-credible, weak-minded, like, oh, that was a hallucination. Why are you taking it seriously? And so we know a lot less about these experiences because people are afraid to share them. And we have done something to try to ameliorate that a little bit on the Academy for the Advancement of Post-Materialist Sciences website, and I encourage any of your listeners to join in on this if they wish. We have a particular um, sub-site called TASTE, T-A-S-T-E, which is for um, transcendental experiences of scientists to actually put their experience on the website and how it transformed their lives so that we get more scientists that are willing to share this to actually put the data out there for others to see. And right now, I think we have about a hundred of those experiences so far. This was actually started by Charlie Tart at UC Davis a number of years ago, and now we're trying to continue this. So if more people were willing to share that would put aside their worry about credibility by colleagues, I think that would help us as well. It's very, it's very interesting because it, put, it sheds the light also on something that I think is, is worth looking to, that science as a methodology, or I, I, I mean, as a social methodology, works as a mechanism of exclusion. And I don't mean that even in a negative way, because basically science as a community uh, uh, creates also with the methodology of peer review, uh, a kind of, it creates credibility, distinguished between credible science and non-credible science, and that's fine. That's basically, mm -hmm. that's how you create quality control. Yeah. But what's the basis of quality control? And what you're describing is that uh, certain experiences like this are uh, uh, in the taboo zone because, uh, and here meets science also uh, life reality, here this kind of reality, and you experience it and admit it, it's, it's career destruct, uh, it destroys your career. It does. So, yes. Science is not just kind of a, uh, a kind of a, a harmless uh, kind of uh, mental technology. It's also a social technology, how we create knowledge together. That's of course, is very interwoven with our uh, career plans, how we live together, who is successful, who is not successful. So if there is an established paradigm, it's dangerous uh, to uh, be outside this paradigm because you are basically outside the in-group. That means also uh, you're not a credible scientist anymore. And to some degree, I'm completely okay with that because uh, you have to find criteria, but then you have to really look, you have to look very carefully what the, are these criteria and do they hold, uh, are they waterproof? And what you're saying that people basically, basically have to lie in order to be part of the scientific community. Yeah, they do. And I think that what's interesting is we see so many examples of that. I think one that happened a number of years ago was with um, Sir John Eccles, who was given the Nobel Prize in England and uh, doing a very interesting research in neurophysiology that I studied as a young graduate student. And toward the end of his career, when he hit, I think, about his 70s, he started being interested in consciousness being fundamental. And he began to write articles on that and a book on that. And suddenly his fellow neuroscientist said, oh, he's become senile now. And that's why he's into this thing that's not so materially oriented. And we have other um, current people that have received Nobel Prizes that are beginning to do research in this area, and the same thing happens to them. Their universities then like, are not so interested in supporting their continuing research in this area and giving them graduate students to work um, with them on this research. And I think that's very sad that all the person does is switch their research emphasis, and now you say they've become weak-minded. And how can that really be? I mean, it's like, don't you trust all those years of beautiful research they did and say, Go for it, go to this new area and see what you can find.
and uh, to, to, a little bit turn the table, one could make scientific arguments that the reason for that uh, is uh, to protect uh, an existing paradigm just because it is the ruling paradigm. And uh, that it's worth to look closely, is this paradigm justified or is it not justified? And uh, also it's a very scientific, uh, I think, perspective to see it's, it's human uh, when paradigm and career planning intertwine, that there are social mechanisms that one has to look very carefully, that there may be forms of exclusion that are not scientifically based, but in the end are dogmatic. Absolutely. And I'll give you another example. I have published many, many articles in various journals like experimental brain research, et cetera. And they would be research on neurological mechanisms underlying, for example, balance control and walking and aging. And I had no trouble getting those articles published in those journals. Then I published with a graduate student, or I, I submitted to one of these journals, a research study on meditation. And instantly, without even having it go out to peer reviewed, um, reviewers, basically what the editor said was, no, um, this is not, this is only descriptive research, it's not real scientific research, and we don't actually publish that. And it was using a paradigm very, very similar to my previous research. And mm -hmm. all I can say is the word meditation or Tai Chi makes them suspect that this is not, quote unquote, real, um, valid research. And so the editor doesn't even allow it to go out for review. So that's what we're dealing with in science. And I'm not sure what to do about that. I mean, it, it just, I'm hoping that with more and more, little by little, more and more researchers giving research out there, it will begin to make this type of research more accepted as normal. And people will be curious about the outcomes rather than just excluding it from actually even getting into publication. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, people say that uh, it, it, it's, it's kind of a cliche, but uh, it's maybe true anyway. There are some similarities how the church in the medieval time defended their status quo and their uh, uh, identity against new forms of thinking that uh, came in with science. Because uh, from, from our perspective, uh, what the church did is so crazy that basically uh, uh, fighting Galilei, uh, fighting Copernicus and, and all the kind of stuff. But uh, when, you, when you look closely, uh, there, there is also rationality to it because uh, someone uh, like Galilei uh, said something uh, that uh, uh, if you look at face value, looks pretty crazy. Basically, don't trust your senses, trust mathematics more than what you experience. Uh, the sun is not rising. Uh, and, uh, and, and to see that that, that could, can be for a culture very unsettling, that basically, I mean, we still uh, say that the sun is rising after 300 years of science, where the mathematics tells us something. But basically, it says distrust. You, you, your relationship to reality is not real. The only real relationship is mathematics. Distrust everything what your senses tell you. And to some degree, science has a point there. But it was not so irrational from, from, the, from the church point of view to kind of say, wait a moment, this is crazy. Uh, to study this, uh, to, that this kind of thing of mathematics is more important than basically what our heartfelt relationship to reality is about. And maybe they have a point too. Yeah, well, I think that you're very right that when you talk to a typical skeptic um, neuroscientist, if we, if we would have somebody right now in dialogue with the two of us, I think what they would say is, well, look, this is something I have never experienced in my entire life. You know, I, beyond my five senses, that's all I know that exists. And so how can you tell me that, in fact, somebody could observe the resuscitation team in a hospital trying to resuscitate them from outside their body? I haven't experienced that and my friends haven't experienced it. And so I think that what I noticed, because I was exactly the same way when I was a young neuroscientist, is that if I haven't experienced it, I consider it not real. And because these phenomena happen um, to only certain portions of our population or certain people often in um, dire straits in a certain sense, like being under cardiac arrest or other traumatic events, we then tend to put them aside as, again, not normal. And I think we need to be willing to accept that just because maybe 95% of us haven't experienced something doesn't mean that it's not real. And maybe as people are learning, you can actually be trained to have experiences that are deep in meditation that are very, very meaningful. So I think that we should 
stop being so black and white about this and actually consider that um, training, for example, may be an important way of helping people um, in the universities and other places actually increase their abilities in these ways. Yeah. And the interesting sign point that for 99% of us, mathematics is pretty unreal. At least uh, the, the way I understand mathematics, I only uh, understand it out of trust. Uh, and, and, and the trust uh, is based on, uh, beside education and uh, culturalization, uh, that through technique, uh, it, it has proven something. Yes. But uh, that comes back to the point uh, that I uh, made early on, there are areas like medicine and ecology, where this particular point of view uh, does not work anymore or creates results like the ecological disaster, yeah. where there are good arguments that our scientific only on abstract mathematical based relationships to reality, and the same with medicine, creates results that, that are counterproductive. So there is a reason to uh, really say rational reasons, scientific reasons, to say, wait a moment, we don't get the results that we want. Maybe something is wrong with our methodology. Uh, uh, may maybe we have to expand it. It doesn't say that science is bad. Newton is still OK, even if there's Einstein. Uh, maybe uh, we have to go beyond also the Einstein in this and, and, and break open the material scientific uh, paradigm and see that this, this is just a special case in the bigger universe. Right. I mean, I think that's exactly the case. And I think that when you think about that shift toward a sense of interconnection with others and, and this loving interconnection with our planet as well, you see that that would shift so many things from our wanting to use up resources as fast as we can for our own comfort to just saying, wait a minute, maybe I want to share the comfort and maybe I want to share it with future generations. And I'm willing to have maybe a few more austerities than I have right now because I'm using things up in such a you know, amazingly abundant way in a certain sense. And I, I keep thinking about that because whenever we talk in a materialist paradigm about um, things like pollution and people will have to give up some of their comforts in order to deal with this, like perhaps driving less or um, carpooling or whatever the things are, there's a certain resistance until they think about exactly what that means to the entire planet as a whole, as one unit, one interconnected whole, and also mm -hmm. future generations as one interconnected whole as well. And then suddenly, at least for me, my heart opens up and it's like, sure, I can give up some things. I'm willing to do that so that the whole planet can be nourished. And what you're saying also points to something that uh, I think is maybe one of the main problems of the scientific paradigm you, you also made the point how this is a third person perspective and uh, it doesn't take into account the first person perspective because the first person perspective uh, is not full without values. The first person always values or disvalues reality. And what the scientific perspective and the, the, the absolute uh, taking the, uh, this uh, third person perspective absolute does is that there's a Chinese wall between the so-called objective reality and our values, our loving or not loving, but re a real relationship to reality. So we are the, the caring or not caring humans that we are, we are disconnected from this reality that we created with science. And uh, there is no way how to relate to that. But when we see that this Chinese wall does not really exist, we made it up and then by making this split, then we also can talk in a very rational way that uh, loving relationship is not a subjective experience. Uh, it has uh, as much reality as any mathemat mathematical uh, calculus. It's just something that has to be brought in from a different perspective, but there are scientific arguments that we need this perspective. It's not just a uh, kind of, oh yeah, I have this preference, you have this pre that preference. No, we can talk about this in a very rational way that we need uh, certain values uh, yes. to be together in this, in this world. Yes, and I think that a lot of young people that are scientists now that I'm interacting with in our Academy for Advancement of Post-Material Sciences are feeling that they are the ones that are concerned about the future for very good reason. And 
one of the things that I'm also discovering, there was just an article that came out this last year, 2020, on training children in the schools in mindfulness, in mindfulness meditation. These were sixth graders and showing that with that, they ended up finding much, much less mind wandering in the children, more focused attention. And of course, more focused attention tends to lead to more health, more ability to work um, effectively in the world as they grow up into adults. And so I, I think that one thing I want to stress for the future is let's try in our educational system to see if we can help increase this sense of quieting the mind, focusing the mind, which allows us to have more of a sense of unity consciousness. That's one of the things that our meditation research has shown over and over again, is it increases compassion. It increases a sense of really wanting to care for others in the world. It also leads to my uh, last uh, set of questions. Uh, where do you see a perspective to open the materialist paradigm in the future? Do you see tendencies where opening is happening, uh, how can we develop also um, supportive strategies to allow this opening to happen? Very, very good question. I think that there are two different ways that I think of it right now. One is that there are getting to be more and more societies like our own, the AAPS, um, the Scientific and Medical Network, um, which is in um, Britain, um, a number of places like that where scientists and non-scientists alike can join them and help try to move this forward, whether it's with more research funding or um, listening to these conferences and sharing them with friends. So that's one way that it can be done. And also our own society, along with the Scientific and Medical Network, the Institute for Noetic Sciences, are trying to create an academic consortium which will be across a number of universities and will have private funding bringing in money for research. And we believe that once individual researchers that are interested in this area can receive funding and have like-minded researchers from around other universities around the world as supporting them, we will be able to do more research in this area. And we can get a certain critical mass of researchers where once we hit that mass, then more of science will begin to accept this as a real phenomenon that needs to be investigated more thoroughly. Mm -hmm. So I think those are two things. And then finally, for me, it is the education. It's starting young in the schools and finding ways to help children actually connect with their own inner essence and find that place of stillness that helps them also connect with others in a more unity consciousness way, more compassion. Yeah, I really wanted to ask you about this already before when you touched on education. Because maybe one transition point is also uh, the mindfulness revolution, if I may call it this way. Because the, mind, the mindfulness education, um, it sounds like harmless, like basically just relax, uh, uh, yeah, just be here now, uh, let go. Uh, it's all, all very nice. And it also can be done to something just very nice. But in itself, uh, it undoes something uh, that is the foundation of our at least 300 years old natural science education to everything see as a separate object relating to, to a separate subject relating to objects. I think we underestimate how we as a cultural process since Descartes uh, kind of are trained to basically always take in everything the perspective of a separate subject that deals with objects out there. And the mindfulness education just um, makes a stop and say, wait a moment, maybe uh, if I really am mindful right now, maybe this, di this division dissolves. And maybe from there, I have to rebuild, if I may say so, the world in a different way. Yes, I think that's absolutely true. I, I think that for me, what's happened is that when I really understand that my awareness, my consciousness is actually part of an entire network of consciousness that spreads throughout the world with all humans, with all animals, etc. It allows me to feel that connection much more readily. And, and I think the other thing I just want to remember is that study that I think I mentioned to you before that was by Claudio Orellana Rios in Germany, where they trained people in hospice care to take care of patients 
after having done mindfulness training for a number of weeks, and they showed how all of their feelings of burnout and a sense of being overwhelmed by patients that were in hospice who were dying began to shift, and they began to feel this way of being able to have compassion for themselves and others in a way that would allow them to actually heal others and allow them to pass in a more beautiful, loving way than they had before. So I think that there's another example, if we can train people in the healthcare system in mindfulness, that will allow us to give healthcare in a much more uplifting, beautiful way than the way we do it right now, where all we can think about is protecting someone from death, no matter how um, difficult that makes life for that person while they're doing it mm -hmm. and for the relatives, et cetera. So it would actually transform healthcare, I think, if we brought this into healthcare. And um, I mean, I'm, I'm opening here something that I hope it's not too big in the end of an interview, <laughs> but uh, it, it is very relevant uh, in the COVID crisis that we are right now, which is also a big crisis of our understanding of life and death. And it shows also, I mean, it's great there's a vaccine. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong about it, uh, as long as the vaccine is safe. Uh, but it sh also shows that we have a very technical relationship to uh, relate to such a pandemic, and part of the relationship is also uh, coming from a certain fear uh, of uh, in our non-relationship to death. Yes, and that. Uh, this mass phenomenon of the pandemic also at least uh, pushes us, uh, to force us is maybe too much to say, but it pushes us to uh, open up a different relationship that uh, the borders between life and death are maybe not as absolute as we, uh, as, as we assume them in our materialist understanding of life. And it forces us to also open up something here that we have closed down because it's very obvious that death uh, we have a strong tendency to exclude death from everything that our life is about. Yes, I think that that's so critical because, in fact, I think this particular study of, um, by the German group, Orlana Rios and her colleagues, was actually saying is that um, if we treat people in a hospice setting where we know that they are on their way toward dying, toward moving onto another realm, in this loving way, we give them. A, a sense of their own value, um, not only now in life, but also that there will be a continuity in death. And they feel their passing is so beautiful and so sacred for the family and for the person and the healthcare workers themselves. And when instead we think that death is the end and that's it, we have a very odd relationship with it in the hospital and everybody is rushing around frantically trying to keep that heart beating. And when the heart stops, everybody feels like they were a failure, even though death is perfectly natural and it happens to everyone. So right there, whether it's with COVID or other um, types of illnesses and, and just the end of life, if we would shift our awareness to that materialist perspective, which is once the heart stops, that's it, you're gone. Um, and and being frantic about keeping people alive to knowing this is a natural passage that we will all go through, I think it will shift our relationship with ourselves and with others to a whole new higher compassionate level than we've had before. Yeah. And at the same time, I really want to make the point again that the argument that you're bringing is not an anti-scientific, anti-rational argument. It is a very rational argument to look at the limitation of science as it is right now. So in, in, in itself, it looks at the limited rationality of science as it is, and is it, it is not kind of neo-romantic, mythological, anti-scientific. It's looking at the limitations of the scientific rational in, in the very rational, but in that also compassionate perspective that maybe uh, uh, seems to be important right now. Yes, I, I totally agree with you, Tomas. And I think that if that's what people could truly understand, that we're not trying to get rid of the scientific paradigm, it's wonderful. We're simply trying to expand it to allow it to actually see things in a broader perspective that would allow us to, in fact, give more compassion, more love, and more care to other people on the planet. That's all that we really want in terms of our moving our science forward. Dr. Weller, could we also, at the end of our time, thank you so much for this conversation. Thank you. It was wonderful to talk with you.